Hello, this is Jack Jackson. We have talked about the fact that the 19th century, the 1800s, was characterized a lot by the age of rigor, that a lot of things were uh, being made more rigorous there, and this is no more apparent than in the birth of real analysis. So real and complex analysis were were created or born in the uh, 19th century and grew there. Cauchy was the undisputed leader in the foundation of both real and complex analysis, and I talk about him some in the previous video. And real analysis is a theoretical basis for calculus, basically proving everything uh, that in calculus works. So for more than a century, calculus was recognized as a stunning intellectual development and as a marvelous tool for studying many physical phenomena. So after its creation uh, in the late uh, 17th century, uh, many calculus techniques then were developed during the 18th century. There were also some attempts in the 18th century to provide a more rigorous uh, justification of calculus while advancing the knowledge about the foundations of the subject but they were all insufficient in some respects, and most of the work was, was focused on developing new calculus techniques and applying them to lots of real-world phenomena, especially in, in physical sciences. But Cauchy was able ultimately to correct these deficiencies by providing a sol solid theoretical basis for calculus. And in doing so, he really opened up the age of rigor in mathematics. He established the modern epsilon delta concept of limit as the foundation for calculus, and he used limits to make rigorous the concepts of continuity and limits of functions and of sequences of numbers. Cauchy shifted the concept of an integral to a limit of a sum rather than it's an antiderivative. He was also the founder of complex analysis, applying calculus techniques to complex numbers as well. De Lambert had used the idea of limits as his basis for calculus, but it was a very uh, preliminary version compared to Cauchy's. Lagrange considered calculus to be based on power series, and Euler used quotients of infinitesimals to describe derivatives. Lacroix replaced Lagrange at École Polytechnique in 1799. In 1801, right at the beginning of the 19th century, he wrote an influential calculus text that combined the methods and approaches from the Newtonian and Leibniz traditions, including all the various approaches of these attempts at rigor, and he was attempting to give a thorough overview and synthesis of the various developments of calculus up to that date. But Cauchy really found all of them lacking in rigor, and that prompted him to further develop the idea of limits as the basis for calculus. One of the things that uh, was a problem, say, with using the series power series approach of, say, Lagrange was Cauchy found the Taylor series for f of x equals e to the negative x squared plus e to the power negative 1 over x squared does not converge to the original function. Bizarre, right? So it was also found that not all functions could be represented by power series. And that made Lagrange's approach insufficient to being the sole basis for calculus. In 1821, Cauchy first published his ideas on the foundations of calculus, and we could point to this as the birth of modern real analysis, even though, of course, these other things uh, that we've talked about here are actually predate that by some. Um, interesting enough, Bernard Bolzano, uh, born in 1781, died 1848, was a Czech who had some very similar ideas, and some of them were even published before Cauchy's ideas. But being uh, being a Czech, that wasn't where the uh, main mathematical thrust was at the time. A lot of his things were not as widely read. He wrote it in his own language, uh, not in the more common, uh, you know, French or German or English. Um, he's now famous for what's called the bolzano weierstrass theorem, giving any bounded infinite set S of real numbers, there exists a real number R in every neighborhood of which there are other points of S. Uh, these are, this picture up here is, is Lacroix, and this one down here is Bolzano. So Cauchy was able to 
apply his rigorous definition of limits to, read, to define derivatives and integrals in terms of them. He then used these to rigorously prove many of the results and techniques of calculus that have been used in use for some time. So he was responsible for our modern focus on the definition of an integral as the limit of an area approximation technique. Cauchy proved the mean value theorem and used it to prove uh, the Cauchy mean value theorem and other results in calculus, including the fundamental theorem of calculus, which connects differential and integral calculus. And Cauchy did considerable foundational work with infinite series. He's responsible for some of the tests that we do for convergence and divergence of infinite series that we study in courses like Calculus 2, um, including the direct comparison test, the integral test, the ratio test, the alternating series test. So these ideas and techniques from Calculus 2 date to the 19th century then and the work of Cauchy. Some other important advancements there were by Fourier. He was from 1768 to 1830, so late 18th, early 19th century. He continued his representation of functions as series of trigonometric functions into the 19th century, and so further work was done there. Dirichlet from 1805 to 1859 was a student and colleague of Fourier. He continued to work on Fourier series and applied Cauchy's style analysis to functions and integrals. Riemann, born in 1826 and died in 1866, picked up on the earlier work of Cauchy, Fourier, and Dirichlet to make integration more rigorous. Uh, the modern approach to integration that is taught in undergraduate textbooks is due to Riemann in a paper from 1853. Riemann's integral definition allowed more functions to be integrable than Cauchy's uh, approach to integrals. Weierstrauss, from 1815 to 1897, was his lifespan. He did further critical work in real analysis, correcting some details in the convergence of functions from Cauchy. And his work firmly completed the transition to rigor in the definition of limits, continuity, and related concepts. In his work, there's no mention of infinitely small quantities. That has kind of vanished, and now everything is based on uh, firmly on our limit foundation. Uh, unfortunately, Weierstrauss did not publish many of his ideas, but his students developed and published the results. Uh, Heine and Kovlevsky were two of these uh, students who did. Uh, published some of his work. So let's talk about a few of these um, mathematicians in more detail. Lejeune Dirichlet, uh, actually Johann Peter Gustav Lejeune Dirichlet, was born in 1805 and died in 1859 in what is now present-day Germany. He studied at the Jesuit College in Cologne with uh, George Simon Ohm, the, who, who lived from 1789 to 1854, is an important mathematician, but he's best known for Ohm's law on electrical resistance. Uh, Dirichlet uh, suffered a little bit because the German education standards in mathematics were not, not extremely high, not as high as those in France. So uh, when he got the opportunity, he moved to Paris to continue his education. He started his education in Germany, but he moved to, to Paris because there was better mathematical instruction there. And this is kind of interesting because eventually he returned to Germany and because of his efforts and others, uh, but some of, the, some of the lead was taken by him, uh, German mathematical education improved greatly and eventually became the best in the world by the end of the uh, 19th century. He made an intense study of, jo of Gauss's uh, arithmetic book, he had, which was published right at the beginning of the century. He had interactions with many top mathematicians such as Fourier, Laplace, Lacroix, uh, Legendre, and Poisson. He also did uh, some work on uh, some number theory. Euler had proved for Ma's last theorem for n equals 3 and n equals 4, and Dirichlet uh, proved the theorem for n equals 5 and later for n equals 14. So he made some progress on that, on cases of it. In 1825, he returned to Germany and taught at the University of Berlin 
and uh, did his research there from 1828 to 1855. Um, in 1831, he married Rebecca Mendelssohn. Uh, she was the sister of the famous composer Felix Mendelssohn. Uh, he collaborated with, with Carl Gauss, and uh, in 1855, uh, Gauss died, and then Dirichlet took his position uh, at Göttingen. So he's, the last uh, four years of his life, he was uh, in the same chair that Gauss held at Göttingen. He was a friend and collaborator with Jacobi, and they both uh, did some work in number theory. He was the founder of analytic number theory. He did work in mechanics, potential theory, differential equations, theory of Fourier series. Uh, he taught Riemann, and he influenced several areas of mathematics, and he was uh, a, a very important as an educator as well. Bernard Riemann uh, lived from 1826 to 1866. It's in Germany. It strikes me how as many of these mathematicians, how much they accomplished in sometimes relatively uh, short lifespans. So that he, you know, for example, Riemann only lived to be about 40 years old, um, and he accomplished such uh, great work. He was the son of a Lutheran minister who was his early teacher. In 1840, he entered the Lyceum in Hanover. In 1846, the University of Göttingen. He studied with Gauss and Stern, Moritz Stern there. In 1847, he uh, went to Berlin University studying with Steiner, Jacobi, Eisenstein, and especially Dirichlet, uh, especially his relationship with Dirichlet, uh, which has uh, really helped him uh, grow. And his work was highly praised by Gauss which was a pretty rare thing. Gauss didn't hand out compliments very often. In fact, he was kind of notorious for, uh, you know, not doing the opposite, in fact. Um, so uh, he went back to Göttingen and finished his dissertation under Gauss. Uh, and of course, it was about the what's now called the, the Riemann integral. He also did complex analysis, geometry. He worked with non-Euclidean geometry. And his work on Riemannian geometry was the basis for the general theory of relativity, um, uh, Albert Einstein's work and so forth later on in the next century. He did work with topology. Uh, he did work on the number of primes less than a given number. There's a, a famous uh, hypothesis, a conjecture, Riemann hypothesis. Um, is that the zeta function has infinitely many non-trivial complex roots and they all have real part one half. Here's the zeta function here. It's it's the sum of uh, over all uh, natural numbers one over n to the s and that that equals the product over all primes of one over one minus p to the minus s. So um, this is a very important unsolved problem. It's one of the millennium problems. There's a group of problems uh, selected by the Clay Institute and uh, at the turn of our current century. And that uh, these problems, uh, if, if someone were to solve one of them, they, there's a million dollar prize associated with each one of them. And the Riemann hypothesis is one of the uh, more famous of, of the bunch. So Riemann did a lot of remarkable things in his uh, uh, 40 years of life there. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with his name from your calculus classes if you had one. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Carl Weierstrass. Um, he was born in 1815, died in 1897, lived in Germany. His father was a public official who encouraged Carl to study finance, but after some lackluster academic performance, he enrolled at the Academy in Munster, where he studied elliptic functions with Gutermann. And he became a secondary teacher, teaching multiple subjects. But then his uh, mathematical studies uh, took off. He studied abelian functions and 
um, did a paper on that in 1856. He eventually got a university position at the University of Berlin. He studied elliptic functions, analytic functions, and application of geometry and mechanics. And especially he is known for his work in real analysis, where he could be said to have completed finishing the transition to fully rigorous treatment of calculus that uh, Cauchy had begun earlier in the century. He discovered a function that was everywhere continuous but nowhere differentiable. So this crazy function that kind of freaked everybody out because nobody thought such a thing was possible. So that really made people start questioning their intuition and mathematics couldn't be based on just necessarily your intuition, but had to be rigorously proved. He collaborated with Coomer and, and Kronecker in Berlin, and he ended up teaching uh, very many top ranking mathematicians, including uh, this just a, a small partial list here, Cantor, Fabrinius, Holder, Klein, Lee, Minkowski, Kolesky, and, and many others. Uh, he didn't publish a lot of his work, so some of his uh, work was left to some of his students. I want to lift up one of those right now, and that is Sofia Kovlevskia. Um, so this is her first name. Oops, let's back up. This right here, Sophia, was her first name. Valisi of uh, Vasily was her father's name. So that's kind of where this name comes from here. Corbin uh, Krukov, uh, Krukovsky was her maiden name. Her husband's name was Kavalevsky. Kavalevsky is the female version of the male Kavalevsky. And later in her life, uh, especially, she was known by her friends as Sonia. So sometimes you'll see her listed as Sonia Kovalevsky. Sometimes you'll see her Sophia, sometimes Sophie. Um, so there's some different versions of her name, plus some different spellings. Uh, when you take Russian names written in their Russian alphabet, the Cyrillic alphabet, and you turn them over to uh, the, the, the Latin or Roman alphabet that we use, uh, sometimes there's differences in how things are spelled. So you're going to see a variety of different spellings and, and listings of her name. Uh, I'm going to call her Sofia Kovalevsky. So in 1850 to 1891 were her, her, uh, her dates there. So again, she, she only lived about, uh, I guess, at 41 years. She's Russian. Her parents were, were of the Russian nobility, and she had tutors. Um, and uh, her family was close to the author Dostoevsky. And um, she was encouraged, uh, you know, to have some, uh, some education as a date. And at age 11, uh, her uncle kind of encouraged her to study mathematics. And it's kind of interesting thing that she actually had uh, – her walls were papered with papers on differential and integral calculus at the age of 11, which she studied. And after some introductory studies in mathematics from her tutor, she was told to quit studying math by her father, but she then got hold of some more advanced math books and studied them at secret at night after everybody went to bed or whenever she could sneak some time to get to them. And one book on optics included some trigonometry she didn't know, so she just worked out the theory of trigonometry all on her own, uh, kind of in the same way that it was worked out historically. And uh, this was, you know, some people recognized this and, again, encouraged her a little bit to study some mathematics. But she had a real problem here that women at that time were not allowed, uh, were not encouraged to study mathematics. And furthermore, um, they were, they weren't even, it wasn't even allowed for uh, an unmarried uh, woman of, uh, you know, of, of social standing to travel uh, by herself. She needed to have a family escort. Well, she sort of found a way around this. Uh, and at 18 year old, she married Vladimir Kovlevsky as a way to travel outside of, of her hometown and travel around Europe to learn things about mathematics. He was a science, uh, uh, 
young scientist as well. He wanted to travel, but it was really a marriage of convenience. There's no no particular love there. Uh, they they treated each other more like brother and sister than as a married couple when they traveled around. In fact, she referred to him as her brother in her letters. Um, so they went to St. Petersburg. She snuck into lectures there uh, with permission of the instructors, but not, in let, not letting other folks know that she was there because that would have been frowned upon. At Heidelberg, she got some more advanced training. And again, she had to get permission of the instructors to go there. In 1871, she moved to Berlin to study with Weierstrauss, and they would not let her take classes at the university there, again, because she was a woman. So uh, in, in a way, that kind of worked her advantage because instead of going to classes, uh, Weierstrauss uh, had given her an examination to see if she... Um, you know, knew anything about mathematics to, to kind of gauge her knowledge and, and talent. And he was extremely impressed with uh, what she was able to do and solving the, the problems that he gave her. So he actually agreed to be her private tutor. Uh, so about, about four years, I think, she was uh, private lessons directly with Weierstrauss. So that actually maybe was even better than what she would have gotten going to classes there. In 1874, she completed three papers, each of which uh, Weierstrauss, at least, thought were, was worthy of a doctorate. Uh, one was on partial difference equations, one was on Belian integrals, and one was on Saturn's ring. And eventually, she was granted a doctorate, summa cum laude, from Göttingen University. That made her the first female to receive a doctorate in mathematics. She returned to Russia. She and her husband actually ended up losing uh, most of their wealth on some uh, speculation schemes where they're trying to invest in different things and it uh, didn't pan out. Uh, at this, somewhere around this point, uh, she and her husband started to uh, be more like an actual married couple and uh, eventually even had a daughter. But she was never able to get a good mathematical position and she, and her husband had periods of of a depression and after some of their financial problems he eventually committed suicide finally in 1889 she was awarded a university position in stockholm and she worked there the rest of her life her best work was actually done in stockholm uh, she was given a prize mathematical prize for study of a rigid body and she did a lot of work and differential equations, and as I mentioned earlier, she also worked on Weierstrauss's uh, papers and helped work on um, publishing some of them. So, this this idea of real analysis got started in the 19th century, mainly with Cauchy, and then a number of people added to that, uh, most significantly kind of at the end with Weierstrauss, and so mathematics uh, well, calculus was now put on a firm foundation and uh, the need for rigor in mathematics uh, became very apparent as, uh, as, as people found more and more interesting counterexamples to some of their intuitive ideas. And so uh, the age of rigor had arrived and the work in real analysis was definitely in the forefront of that.